Hey, this is Drew Baird from Moon Audio, and we're here to talk about the Hugo 2 today. Uh, we're going to do some comparisons to the older model. We're going to talk about some of the connection options and how to use the Hugo 2. Uh, we're also going to talk about some exciting new things that will be coming out from Cord this fall. First, let's talk about a little bit of uh, some comparisons between the original Hugo and the Hugo 2. The Hugo is without a doubt a groundbreaking product. Nobody had produced a portable headphone amp DAC of this sort of quality and caliber before. There really was no other comparisons in the field in my opinion. And amazingly enough, Hugo 2 is still a groundbreaking product in that now they have doubled the processing power from the original Hugo. They've maintained the battery life, which is very impressive. They've made lots of improvements to the chassis and the connections. They've added a, uh, a filtering scheme now, digital filtering, to sort of shape, if you will, uh, the sound characteristics of the filter. The chassis is much nicer, connections are flusher, easier to connect to all your existing cables. We had a little bit of a problem with the original Hugo, the first iteration, in that RCA cables and coax cables just weren't uh, connecting properly because of the chassis. All of these bugs have been worked out. Like I said, the, the battery power has remained constant between the Hugo 2 and the Hugo 1, which is just absolutely amazing considering the doubling of the processing power. So you're still getting about eight to nine hours of battery life. It really comes down to what kind of headphones you have. If you're using IEMs, obviously the load is a lot less demanding of the battery life, and so you should get longer battery life. If you're using something a little more demanding, let's say an Odyssey LCD4, planar dynamics tend to uh, use a lot of power and can eat up the battery life. So in that instance, you may see some shorter battery times, but we're not talking about, you know, a couple hours. We're talking about probably like six hours or something like that before you have to charge. I always carry an external battery pack with me when I'm traveling, and I would recommend it just because, you know, if you're on a long flight from here to Tokyo, you, you, you know, you, you may not get a full battery life all the way through your trip. They've added a filtering scheme to it. They've added more crossfade options. They've added control balls for all of these settings versus the, the touch buttons that they had before. What the digital filtering did, as I alluded to earlier, it tames some of the harshness. If you're listening to a recording that's very analytical and maybe a little stringent, you can change the filter, smooth out, roll it off a little bit, make it more musical. The crossfade is a very exciting function. Essentially what it tries to do is create a 3D holographic uh, sound for headphones. Some true diehard audiophiles may not like this, but others may enjoy playing around with this. I find I like it the most when I'm uh, using the Hugo 2 to watch movies on a computer or an iPad. That's where I really want to be enveloped in the sound, if you will. And they've changed the input uh, connection as well to one of these ball features. I like it a lot better than the very small button they used to have on the back side of the Hugo 1. It was a little complicated to figure out where I was going uh, in terms of inputs and crossfade filtering. You always have to carry around, unfortunately still now, the color code sheet for all the connections um, because each one has a colored light. There is no display on this that tells you, okay, you're on filter one, filter two. You've got to remember what the colors are. Same thing with the inputs. Some of the things I've memorized from constant use with the uh, devices, but some you may still forget. There's just too many to keep up with. Uh, the Bluetooth has been greatly improved on the Hugo 2 and they've put a much larger antenna in it. It's got a longer range. It also does much better, cleaner, better sounding resolution. Most of the time, Bluetooth, I'm just not excited about it. But every once in a while now, I find myself using the Bluetooth to, to connect to devices that I don't typically use. I'm using this more versatile with other devices. And I've seen that the improvement in the Bluetooth is, is quite significant. Other features, they've now bumped up the resolution processing power of what you can do on the inputs all the way up to 768 kilohertz resolution, which is just astronomical. I realize there's not a whole lot of software out there with that higher resolution yet. But rest assured, the Hugo 2 is ready for it. So let's take a closer look at each device. Okay, so here we are taking a closer look at the USB power inputs control side of the Hugo 1 and Hugo 2. Well, notice on the original Hugo, there wasn't a whole lot of writing. So you basically had to memorize essentially what each one of the inputs were, which controls did what essentially. Uh, this first one was the input control for for going through and choosing uh, USB, Toslink, 
coax or your uh, uh, standard definition uh, USB audio from your iPhone or Android device. The next button was the crossfade, which we've talked about earlier. That can create a 3D holographic envelopment of the sound with headphones. Then we move on to the standard definition USB audio connection. This is for connecting your iPhone or Android phone at a lower resolution. Good CD quality resolution, but not high res. Then we move on to the high res USB input. This is where you would connect it to a computer and you'd be able to do PCM, DSD, any resolution that you can throw at it, this unit can process. Then you have the power switch and then the DC barrel charging port. Hugo 2 now has switched to a different 5 volt uh, USB charger, wall wart now. I would highly recommend, as we've talked about with the Mojo before, that you have a USB charger that's at least two amps or higher. I would never use your computer to try and charge a device like this. It only outputs about one amp uh, of power and it'll take forever to charge and it really doesn't charge the device effectively. So make sure that your charger says at least two amps or higher and five volts. Uh, a standard charger that comes with your iPhone isn't going to do it. It's less than one amp. So I recommend you picking up uh, one like our Tron Smart, which is a three amp, or if you've got, like everybody else, a drawer, drawer full of phone chargers, check them all out and see which one's two amp. We've now narrowed it down to just one USB input. So the Hugo 2 now auto senses what sort of device is connected to the USB, whether it be a phone or computer, and it automatically knows what to do and how to route the uh, um, audio filtering. Uh, we've now, uh, like I said, gone to a rollerball input button selector switch. It's labeled now, so it's easy to find. Um, you don't necessarily have to remember all the colors. You know, obviously, if you've only got one device connected to the Hugo 2 and you start pushing that input device, uh, you'll see a light pop up inside the Hugo 2 that tells you that you've locked onto a digital signal. So that usually means that you've gotten to the right input. Uh, the filter, which we did not have on the original Hugo 2, we do uh, digital filtering, which we can shape the sound of the music either warmer or sharper for more uh, of an analog audio. I mean, not analog. Well, the warmer would be analog, but it's still, you know, it's a warm digital processor, but I can't say that it sounds like a uh, turntable at this point. Um, but you can do a sharper, more audiophile analytical sound, uh, uh, you know, depending on the filter as well. Um, we've also added a couple of more functions to the crossfade. Uh, before, I think there were only maybe two crossfade functions. Now I think we have four. Uh, the power is now not a switch, but a ball. So it'll go through a power cycle and light up when you've got power. It'll tell you battery life now, depending on the color, uh, what, what, what your battery life is at. And you'll notice two little divots on each side of the Hugo 2. This is for a future product that hasn't really been talked about yet. Supposedly it will be called the 2GO, which is essentially a poly for the Hugo 2. I think it's going to probably be a lot more powerful. I'm hoping it's going to have more than just one SD card slot, so you can really have a large library of music to go with the Hugo. You'll notice that the Bluetooth antenna is quite a bit larger than the original one. This gives for a much larger distance that you can connect a Bluetooth device to the unit. Um, I think the original one was something like five meters, and I think we're now up to like 15 meters. I must say that the Bluetooth, as I said before, has greatly improved in sound quality. So let's take a look at the other side. So here we are in the opposite side of the devices, and you'll notice first that the volume control now has a little more of a raised section here. I actually find a little bit of a difference in usability of the volume control on the Hugo 2 over the Hugo 1. You know, ergonomics make a big difference. I wouldn't say this is some sort of drastic change, but it just feels a little more comfortable when it's raised like this instead of recessed down into the chassis. Uh, you'll also notice that we still have a quarter inch jack for headphones, a mini jack. The mini jack is no longer recessed as you see here, which in some cases caused issues, especially with right angle connections. If the right angle connection was too sharp, it just wouldn't work and you'd always have to use a straight connection on the original Yugo. We're now flush here so that no matter what the connection you're using, we haven't found one that doesn't fit yet. 
I alluded earlier to the issues we had with the coax jack and the RCAs and the amount of room around them to fit common RCA connections. We found a great connector made by Kimber Cable that worked very well on this coax input, but of all the other RCAs that we had, none of them worked except for this one connection. They've changed the coax now so that it's a mini jack, and we'll get to that in a second. You'll see here that the analog inputs were still larger than the original Hugo One production unit that came out, but there still were a few issues with RCA's fitting. They've made them larger. We haven't found any issues yet. I'm sure there are some very high-end audiophile grade RCA's that are you know, an inch in diameter that aren't gonna fit here. But for the most part, I would say 90% of all RCA's are now fitting in these analog outputs. We still have an optical uh, input as we did in the Hugo One. Uh, that was recessed as well. We had some issues with finding an appropriate connector to work on that. We did solve that and had our Silver Dragon Tosslink cable that worked fine with that recessed jack. You'll notice before that they had a protective cover for the Tosslink. Now they have a door. Please make sure to go to our Silver Dragon Tosslink cable and read about how to properly insert your Tosslink cable when you've got an optical door. If you push it straight in, you're going to scratch your Tosslink cable and damage it, and you'll find over time you're not going to be able to do high-resolution audio, uh, only lower-resolution audio, because you've scratched the optical glass fiber that's in the middle of the cable. So please visit that. It's very important so that you keep your optical cable working well. Optical is still limited to 192 kilohertz input. This has nothing to do with the cord. It has to do with uh, send and receiver chips of optical. It's only been able to do 192 max. I don't see that really ever changing in the future. The coax will give you a 384 digital input from a source device. We'll talk about in a little bit when we go over some exciting new products from cord, how you can increase the resolution of that input. Uh, obviously, the RCA analog outputs are for connecting this Hugo 2 to your home stereo, so you can use this not only as a portable DAC and headphone amp and preamp, but you can use it in your home stereo system, making this device extremely versatile. There are some new exciting products coming out from Cord this fall. The revised version of the Hugo TT, now called the Hugo TT2, a new product called the M Scaler that a lot of people are very excited about. This is a product that can be used with a whole host of cord products. The Hugo 2 TT essentially is the DAC section out of the Hugo 2. The amplifier section has greatly been revised, unlike the original TT that for the most part mimicked the original Hugo. They added a much larger capacity bank, balanced outputs for your stereo, but for the most part it was basically a Hugo with a couple of added features. The Hugo TT2 has so much more. The new headphone amp that's provided in that device is extremely powerful. In fact, Rob Watts said that it can potentially drive speakers. Now, I wouldn't imagine them to, to drive the big Focal Sopras that we have here in-house, but I would imagine that uh, smaller bookshelves and, and speakers that are sensitive uh, should be very easy to drive. Now, we haven't had a TT2 in here yet to test. We'll come back to that once it comes out in the fall. The other device, the M Scaler, is a very interesting device and it goes back to some of the black box devices that were produced back in the 90s if you remember that were called upsamplers. Essentially this device can take your CD quality 44.1 and essentially multiply it 16 times to get you a much higher resolution for higher quality sound listening. They've already got this implemented into their Bluetooth CD transport which does all the same functions as the M scaler but also has a transport in it. Well, as we're getting away from CDs, it seems, this day, I think much more people are excited about this M Scaler in that it can be used to connect to your computer, it can be connected to your existing DACs and existing digital sources, making it much more versatile. It doesn't just have to be used with other cord products. Now, in talking about which cord products you can connect the M Scaler to, unfortunately, the Mojo isn't one of them. You know, the Mojo was designed to be a great bang for the buck, phenomenal sounding, a product they can get into so many more people's hands that can't afford some of the higher end products. Uh, but unfortunately, the M Scaler will not be able to be used with that. A few of the products that it will work with are the Cutest, the Hugo 2, the Flagship Dave, and of course the Hugo TT2, which will be out in the fall. I don't have a unit yet, so I can't show you a whole lot about it. 
Essentially, how you're going to connect the device, the M Scaler, to these other products is via two digital cables with BNCs on both ends. It's a double connection process. And what it's going to do, more so with the Hugo 2, is the original coax jack was only capable of handling 384 resolution. But now when you go to this dual cable BNC on one end and a mini jack on the other and connect it to the M scale, now you've boosted that resolution up to 768. That's pretty impressive. The QDIS is already set up with dual BNC, so you can simply use two BNC digital 75 ohm coax cables to connect the M scaler to the QDIS. Same thing being said here on the Dave. You'll see we've got our Silver Dragon digital cables with our Furetech BNCs already connected, and this can connect essentially straight up to the M scaler, resulting in much higher resolution. So I hope you've enjoyed what we've talked about today on exciting new products coming from Cord, connection options for the various devices. I think we've got a very exciting fall to look forward to with these new products. We'll plan on doing videos on each one of them when they come out, and thank you for joining us.